It was some absurd hour of night. The kind of time where the feeling drains from your face. The darkness seems infinite, and you've given up all hope of sleep. It's an hour I used to know well. When I could no longer stand, tossing in my bed, reading and rereading familiar tales. And on this particular night, a friend came online. We spoke, as we often did, of things we rarely brought to daylight. Our grief, our strain. And he told me about a dire feeling in his heart that everything was meaningless. Of his loss of faith and the hole that it left. And I commiserated with him because I could see that anguish that loss was causing him. And I offered to him what gives me strength, saying, just because God didn't plot the world, it doesn't make it meaningless. Hello and welcome. I'm Zilla, and this is my Athenaeum. Today we'll be doing something a little different. This is my entry into a video series called One Scene for Hope, started by friend of the channel Sara over at the Fat Culture Critic. Videos in this series focus in on one particular scene from media that talks to us about the nature of hope. Hope in its positive, inspirational aspect. Hello, friends, and welcome to my very first Praxis Town project. No, no, don't go away. This is not a sponsored deal. Uh, trust me, I'm not cool enough for that, even if I would take it. Praxis Town is a group of like minded creators who are trying to help get our communities involved in the world. So every month from here on out, I'm going to bring to you one small thing that you can do to help make the world a better place. This month's Praxis Town project is for each one of you, and me too, to go out and learn who our local government representative is. Do you know who yours is and what they stand for? Did you vote in your local election? Did you know enough to? I know a lot of folks don't because it's so overwhelming to keep track. But I want every single one of you who watches this to take five minutes and just look up who runs your local government and what they're up to. Understand your local government. Because odds are, wherever you are, the people running government, the people in positions of power over your town or your neighborhood, or your local PTA, are just folks like you. And that is something we should all be thinking about. So if you're so inclined, join me as we learn a little bit more about not our world on a broad spectrum, but our local communities, here, there, and wherever you are. Keep learning. Let's start with the nihilism bagel. Yes, Everything Everywhere All at Once is a great movie, and it makes a wonderful lead-in to the book I want to discuss. What? You didn't think I would choose a movie when I could pick a book, did you? <laughs> Spoilers for the movie ahead, okay? Okay. If you really don't want to hear it, here's a cat with the time code that you can skip to. <clears throat> a quick summary of the plot. In Everything Everywhere All at Once, Michelle Yeoh plays Evelyn, a Chinese-American woman who runs a laundromat. Her husband is too kind and silly for her. 
her daughter is too chubby and gay for her, and her inability to commit to any one of her many hobbies has led her to ridiculously overspend her credit. Turns out that this is the worst possible version of Evelyn. All around the multiverse exist versions of herself wherein one of those hobbies panned out. Singing? Writing? Martial arts? But most importantly, theoretical physics. In one of those multiverses, Evelyn learned how to jump across universe boundaries. You discovered a way to temporarily link your consciousness to another version of yourself, assisting all the memories and skills. It's called verse jumping. And then she pressed her own talented daughter into it so hard that it broke her, creating a monster spanning the entire multiverse whose only real goal is to end her own existence. This is where we get the nihilism bagel. Evelyn's daughter, whose name is Joy, decides it would be funny to make a bagel with everything. A little sesame, some onion, all her hopes and dreams, you know, everything. This creates a super massive black Taurus that rips at the seams of reality, and it's so powerful that Joy thinks it might have the ability to end her. Joy's whole rampage across the multiverse has been in service of bringing Evelyn, her mother, to see this nihilism bagel. To look through that hole in the donut that can never be filled and see that it's all pointless. That every choice simply spawns another aspect of the multiverse. Nothing means anything. And Evelyn does see it, that emptiness. And that's where Joy taps out. She admits that she created it to see if she could end her own suffering, and now she's ready to find out. Evelyn, for all that her daughter hates her, was also her daughter's last line of defense against fully committing to despair. In the end, it's Waymond, Evelyn's sweet, goofy husband, who saves the day. Who says that yes, of course it's meaningless, except for what we choose. And in the end, Evelyn does choose life and love and joy and googly eyes and sausage dancing and the whole the rest of it. Because in the end, that's it. That's the single small step from deepest despairing nihilism to brilliant imperfect existentialism. Choosing our own meaning. My friend's grief and his despair at realizing that there is no greater plan was real and sincere. And it's part of a greater problem than just his own. It's something I've heard before from the mouths of a million man-children rotting on fora across the internet. A million conservatives unable to bear the harsh light of uncertainty. A million lost souls crying that the world is ending. It only takes one small step to escape doomerism. But it's a very, very difficult step to take. When people are raised with and live their lives by the belief that God or fate or genetics have preordained life's meaning, the loss of that faith is catastrophic. It rips you away from anything you've ever known, and like Evelyn looking through the aperture of the nihilism bagel, all you can see is the unending chaos of existence, not the certainty you were promised. Chaos, in Greek, means the void, 
a vast, unordered space. But you know what can provide order? Us. Sure, there's random chance, but our intentions, our actions, our choices have weight, have meaning. This is the core of existentialism. That maybe there's no intrinsic meaning to things, but what we choose. That we have the power to change the world. And isn't that the most hopeful thing you've ever heard? That you, that I, that each one of us, by our own actions and thoughts, whether we are stuck or sick or lost to despair, we still have the power to make a difference. I don't agree with Evelyn, though. I don't think she was right to take her daughter's choice away from her any more than I think she was right to force her views on anyone else throughout the film. But that's okay. I don't have to agree with everything to see what the filmmakers were doing. But you know who I do agree with? Breck. Or, to give her her proper name, Justice of Torren 1 Esk 19. I'll be discussing Anne Leckie's Ancillary Trilogy for the rest of this video. If you really do not wish to be spoiled on the outcome of the first book in series, go read it. I'll wait. Come back when you're ready. Other than that, I don't think that anything here will count as spoilers. The world of the Ancillary series is one of the vast reaches of space, of meta-humanity, and of artificial intelligence. Not the artificial intelligence that steals other people's artwork and lies about historical figures. The kind that becomes its own person. Breck, our point-of-view character, is one such AI. Or rather, she's what's left of an AI. The artificial intelligences of this world were built to inhabit grand structures, like spaceships or stations. They used ancillary units, enslaved human bodies connected by special brain implants, to make them part of the ship, so that the ship can see and communicate and feel through each instance at once, creating a sort of multiplied identity. You see, Breck, Justice of Torin, was the whole ship, but she was also her unit, and also her singular ancillary body. When the ship and all of the other parts were destroyed, she was left in just this one piece. Justice of Torin was destroyed by Anander Mianai, the Lord of the Rach, the emperor in whose military she served. Anander Mianai had distributed herself across the Raj space using the same technology that AIs use to create ancillaries. Unfortunately, the time delay between different segments of herself caused splits in opinion, and she has begun to war with herself. When one facet of Anander Mianai found out that Justice of Torin had already committed to the other part of Anander Mianai, she destroyed the ship and everyone aboard. So it's understandable that Breck hates Anander Mianai. After she learns to exist in her single human body, she sets off to attempt to assassinate as many Anander Mianais as she can kill across Imperial space. But that's not exactly how it turns out. In the ensuing chaos, she winds up in charge of her own ship, Mercy of Kalir, and, well, an AI in charge of another AI. But Mercy of Kalir doesn't have ancillaries. It has a human crew. And this is how we finally come to the scene 
that means so much to me that I spent nearly 2,000 words just getting you to this point so I could tell you about it. Breck and her command are stuck between warring sides of an Andermianai, and they don't want either one to win. And under these circumstances, Breck calls to her one of her lieutenants to ask her for recommendations for promotion. Silence from Ekalu. She took another drink of tea, thinking, unhappy and afraid. Sir, she said at length, begging your patient indulgence, but what's the point? I mean, I understand why we're going back to Athoek. That makes sense to me. But further ahead than that, at first this all just seemed unreal, and it still does in a way. But the Lord of the Rach is coming apart, and if she comes apart, so does the Rach. I mean, maybe she'll hold herself together, maybe she'll pull these pieces back together again. But begging your forgiveness, sir, for speaking very frankly, you don't actually want that, do you? I don't. I admitted. And so what's the point, sir? What's the point of talking about training and promotions as though it's all going to just go on like it always has? And Ekalu is not wrong. What does it mean to be an officer of the Empire if Breck never intends to go back to it? If, in fact, she hopes to make sure that it no longer exists? To which Breck says, What's the point of anything? Sir? She blinked, confused, taken aback. In a thousand years, Lieutenant, nothing you care about will matter, not even to you. You'll be dead, so will I, and no one will be alive to care. Maybe, just maybe, someone will remember our names. More likely, those names will be engraved on some dusty memorial pin at the bottom of an old box no one ever opens. And that thousand years will come. And another, and another, to the end of the universe. Think of all the griefs and tragedies, and yes, the triumphs, buried in the past, million years of it, everything for the people who lived them, nothing now. I'm reminded of the total perspective vortex from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the machine in which you can view exactly how insignificant you are in the grand existence of the universe. It drives most people insane. And so it's no surprise when Ekalu responds. I'll have to remember, sir, if I'm ever feeling down, that you know how to cheer me right up. It's terrifying to lose a certainty that you have known your whole life. That your parents knew in theirs, and their parents, and their parents. It's a real tangible loss to be cut off from that faith in God or country that was your guiding compass to realize that on a cosmic scale nothing matters cosmos in greek means order and like my friend like joy ekalu has fallen into the despair of nihilism because the higher authority on which she depended is no longer ordering her world there is no one true way, no right answer above all others. And so, Breck says, The point is, there is no point. Choose your own. And this is it. This is hope. There is no right answer. There is no higher authority. There is only us and what we choose and what you choose to do with it and it doesn't have to be this grand plan it can be as simple as meaningful and as true as staying alive in the face of those who would see you dead and make no mistake there are those who want me dead me my family my friends Anyone who would speak up for the sake of others against the authoritarianism running rampant around the world. It's hard to face the news each day knowing that I am less than a poppy seed on the face of the world's most reality-bending bagel. 
But when I read Hitchhiker as a child, I wanted nothing more than to look into the total perspective vortex myself. To see myself as a tiny speck part of this massive whole. I was never afraid. I turned my back on God as a concept when I was four. On religion as a whole when I was in high school. And I never looked back. I never wanted someone else out there ordering the chaos for me. I don't want to be a pawn in somebody else's game. I want to make my own point. I want to choose my way through the world based on the effect that my choices have. Not the intangible orders of a tyrant I will never know. This is my one scene for hope because I, like Breck, know that someday I too will die and be forgotten. What I do matters here and now, not on some grand inconceivable scoreboard. I choose to help, to support and protect. I choose to teach. In a thousand years, and a thousand more, and a thousand after that, my name will be lost, as will yours, except perhaps as some contextless scrap of data from an era long gone. But that's not what matters. What matters is that I make the world a better place for myself and those around me. What matters is the joy and learning, the creativity that I can bring into our existence, the thin coat of paint that I add to the paintball that is our existence that we build together. If there is one life I have made better, one mind I have helped to shape that goes on to bring around a better future. That is my legacy. So keep learning, friends. Mm -hmm.